It is a glorious Easter morning, isn't it? Brass, flowers, the hallelujahs are back. It reminds me of a story. Fellow's driving down the road one morning. All of a sudden, a rabbit jumps out in front of the car. The guy swerves really, really hard to avoid hitting it, but to no avail. Being a sensitive sort and an animal lover, he stops the car, gets out to see what has happened to the rabbit, and he is mortified. Much to his dismay, he has hit and killed the Easter Bunny. A woman drives by and sees this man sobbing by the side of the road, and she stops and gets out to see if she can help. And the guy is inconsolable. I, I accidentally hit the Easter Bunny, and I killed him. Not to worry, she says. She runs back to her car. She grabs a spray can out of it and brings it over, leans over that limp, lifeless Easter Bunny, and sprays the contents on the bunny. Immediately, the bunny jumps up. And he hops down 10 feet down the road, and he turns and he waves. He hops another 10 feet down the road. He turns and he waves. He hops another 10 feet down the road, he turns and he waves. Another 10 feet, another wave, another t and this goes on until he's out of sight. The man is astonished. What was in that can, he asks the woman. She turns the can so the man can read the label. It says, hairspray restores life to dead hair and adds permanent wave. <laughs> It is Easter. <laughs> it's an event that is so familiar and so filled with all kinds of associations. And this is at least the one billionth and one Easter sermon that's ever been preached. What can possibly be said that has not yet been said? One preacher notes that such moments remind her of a violinist she knows who gets a little depressed every November as she contemplates another season of the Nutcracker performances. It's not that she doesn't love the music, it's just that every year she plays the same part. And there's only so much you can do when you're in the third violin section. I know it's orchestra music and it's a classic, she says, but I really wish people knew there was more to the repertoire than the dance of the sugar plum fairy. But you know, some stories are worth telling over and over again. Especially so are the stories that change lives and shift the entire world order. Stories about moments when things will never be the same again. And there is no story worth telling again and again more than that first Easter morning. Listen to these words from the Gospel according to Matthew. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead, and indeed he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. While the core message is the same, each of the four gospel accounts of that first Easter morning differs from the other. Here in Matthew, the story is full and robust, lots of shaking and rattling and rolling. 
Only in Matthew is there a great earthquake and an angel descending from heaven whose appearance was like lightning and the stone being rolled away by this angel to reveal an empty tomb. And the guards so scared they could have been mistaken for bodies to be entombed. This gospel writer wants people to know that this is God's work. This is not about human capacities and possibilities. It is wholly about God's capacity and determination. Ted Wardlaw is the president of Austin Seminary. In his office is a bronze sculpture that depicts that first Easter morning. As Ted describes it, two women are speechless as they behold an empty slab upon which a body, that of Jesus, had been laid out. One of them stands looking at the scene with her hand over her mouth as if she doesn't know what to say or is afraid of what she might say. The other woman is kneeling as if she needs to be nearer the slab in order to take in its grim reality. And she's looking up at her, at her companion as she gestures helplessly and forms an unthinkable question. There are swaths of cloth scattered across the slab. I love this piece. Ted writes, because it captures not only the studied reaction to the news of resurrection, that reaction that we know oh so well, but it takes in that first reaction to the news. Matthew says the two women had both fear and great joy. Maybe like that feeling of leaning over the rim of the Grand Canyon, taking off on a solo flight in a Cessna, holding on to one's child, for the first time, being on that bicycle when the training wheels come off. Do not be afraid, the angel said to them. Do not be afraid. Of what? Do not be afraid that what you're seeing is not real? Or do not be afraid that what you're seeing is real? Which is more frightening? One commentator writes, the call to worship on that first Easter was a shattering earthquake that rippled a seismic shock through history. It signaled that the fault lines of human history had shifted dramatically toward grace and hope. Life would never be the same again, beginning immediately. And that had to be scary. Maybe when we really stop to think about it, it still is. Once when Robert Louis Stevenson was very ill, he received a letter from a missionary who wanted to talk to Stevenson as a man in danger of dying. Stevenson's witty reply went something like this, you should visit me as a man in danger of living. Suppose I get better. Any fool can die, as a matter of fact, all do. I'm going to need much more help if I go on living. Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised. He's going ahead of you. He has been raised. Resurrection means being born again in totally new ways. It was true for those two women. It was true for the disciples who would soon hear that news. It's been true for the church throughout the ages, and it is true for us, for you and me. Resurrection doesn't offer us the choice of going back to the way things were. Back to when the kiddos were small, back before our loved one died, back before the diagnosis. We can't go back to before the company was sold or our bodies began to betray us or before that friendship became strained. Those families in South Korea can't go back before the sunken ferry. Folks in Washington State can't go back in time before the mudslide. We can't go back to before the world changed and people changed, back to before life seemed less complicated or difficult, confusing. But we can go forward. We can go forward knowing that we do not go forward alone. He's not here. He's been raised. He's going ahead of you. We can live as though we know, we know that death no longer has the final word. What would that look like in your life? How might you embrace life a little more passionately? How might you soak in the presence of friends and loved ones a little more deeply? 
How might you show a little more mercy and kindness to strangers? How might you work a little harder to keep hunger at bay in this community? How might you change one daily habit to make the environment more sustainable? How might you be a little more extravagant with your time and your gifts and your energy and your devotion and your heart? How might you live now, today, knowing that death no longer has the final word? Several of you know that Jim and Priscilla Campbell and I go way back. The three of us were classmates at Maryville College. Jim reminded me the other day that our 35th reunion is coming up. Obviously, all three of us were child prodigies. <laughs> I also had the opportunity back then to get to know Jim's dad, Coach Campbell, as he was affectionately known, was a beloved, witty, iconic figure throughout the community, and especially at Maryville High School, where he taught and he coached for over two decades. He was my supervisor when I was student teaching. Coach Campbell obviously loved sports, but he was crazy about baseball. As a player, as a coach, as an umpire, as a spectator, it didn't matter. And his son, by the way, was a standout pitcher. In the last months of his life, Jim Sr. had the occasion to be at a Maryville College baseball game with an old friend who had also been a player and a coach at the college. As his friend was leaving, Coach walked over to the car and motioned to the friend to roll down his window. And then he leaned in and he said, don't you wish we could play in just one more game? Coach Campbell died in 2008. His family gathered prior to his death to be with him, knowing it wouldn't be long. And I'm told that just before he died, surrounded by his loved ones, Coach took one, another deep breath, and, for one, and said one last thing. And what he said was, play ball. Play ball. Coach Campbell knew that death is not the end. The end is life. Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's been raised. He's going ahead of you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of death. And don't be afraid of life. In the face of death and the light of resurrection, allow yourself to live. Worship with abandon. Make a joyful noise and sing with gusto. Revel in this joyous feast that is set before us. He's going ahead of you. He is ahead of you. Step out. Step up in faith. Shake, rattle, and roll. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah.